The Lord be with you. I'm, I'm, turning, I'm telling you, we really got to rethink this order of worship because uh, I'm getting tired of having to follow all this stuff. I tell you what. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Bethany, Pat, Linnell, Sean, everyone who led us in that this morning. That was, was great. Now you got to listen to me for a little bit. I'm sorry about that. That's, we'll work on it. We'll work on it, I promise. This morning we're in 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. That's where we'll be this morning. I believe it's, yeah, there on the wall. I feel a bit like Nebuchadnezzar, the writing <laughs> is on the wall behind me. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy... My beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, But join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed. For I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you for the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do the things you would have us to do. So above all else, God, we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, one day he got what we, at least down in South Alabama, I'm sure you say it here, he got what we call a wild hare. You know. And he decided uh, to get in the car and drive over to Rome to have a little meeting with his mentor. But it wasn't like he was going to drive over and just sit and have a, a steak biscuit with him at Jack's for breakfast. No, where he had to go, he pulled his car into the fenced-in parking lot, parked, walked down the long, covered sidewalk through the brown, painted metal doors, strolled up to the front desk, told the uniform woman there what he was doing there, what his name was. She said, all right, sir, step back behind the yellow line. And she snapped his picture for the security law. Then he was escorted through another set of doors, padded down, guided through the metal detector, After that, he was led to a a large open room with uniformed guards in each corner where he was told to sit and wait on the circle-shaped seat of the cafeteria-style table. And after a few nervous minutes, another set of doors opened and in walked a single guard next to a small, balding, stooped-over man wearing glasses so thick that to everyone who saw him, it looked like his eyes were going to pop out of his head. The little man was in his orange jumpsuit and escorted to sit down in front of him at that end of the table. 
This prisoner held out both hands, cuffed at the wrist, as if he was going to embrace him, but he realized he couldn't, and so he, he quickly moved his hands down, cupped one hand in both, and as he shook his hand, he said, It's so good to see you, Timothy. To which Timothy responded, It's good to see you, Brother Paul. And they sat down at the table for a short visit. Timothy was troubled. Back home in Ephesus, there were problems. There were new preachers with shiny new suits, big fancy cars, new teachers with mystifying lessons about this life and the next. They all claimed they had secret knowledge that only they could give out and only they had. There were those in the congregation at Ephesus, in Timothy's own church, who were always attempting to keep him in check. Those folks who, who kept track of the members he had lost, you know, to the folks across town at the First United Gnostic Church, or to the traditional synagogues of legalism, or, or to those who, who had just wandered, wandered across the street and down the road to the fashionable temple of Diana. There were people keeping track. There were those in the church in Ephesus stirring up all kinds of trouble for Timothy. There were those folks who longed for the days they would say it in secret and sometimes let it slip to them. Oh, I sure do miss when Brother Paul was here. They filled the pews. They would say things like, you know, this is the way we've always done it. We sure do miss Brother Paul. There were those who came with their own religious opinions about how things ought to be. That bunch who would say things like, now, now, I'm not saying that I like them. I'm not saying it's me. But, you know, I've seen those pagans down at the temple, and they got a lot of money. Nice big marble columns out front. Heard they're going to build a gymnasium, put a new sign out front. Welcome to the temple of Diana. I'm not saying that I'm agreeing with them. But maybe we ought to listen to them. And there were those who were always pressuring Timothy, always on top of him to keep the numbers up, to keep folks interested, to compete with the rising wonder of Gnosticism. And in case you don't, Gnosticism was this sort of early sect of Christianity going around telling everyone, well, you know, your body and your soul are really two different things. Your body's kind of nasty and dirty. You want to get rid of that. And you want to be ascended into the spiritual realm where you're free from all this stuff. And the only way to do it, they said, is if you really know the password. This secret knowledge. Timothy had to keep up with that kind of stuff. Timothy had a full ship and no one around to tell him how to raise the sails. And so he wept as he told all of this to Paul. How the pressure was mounting. How it was getting harder and harder to keep the faith. Especially with Paul out of the picture. And most especially with Paul in chains, in prison. And so Timothy put his head down on the table and cried. As he did, Paul reached his chained wrist out slowly, placed them on top of Timothy's head as he whispered a prayer. May God bless you, Timothy. Keep the faith. And as he lifted his hands, the guard came over and said, Time's up. Back to the cell. They escorted Paul back to his prison cell for Timothy to make the long pain drive home back to Ephesus. After being back from a short while, the, mount, the pressure still mounting, everything's still there, Timothy walks out to the mailbox and what's there? A letter from Paul. A second letter from Paul to Timothy in which Paul has, has written to encourage Timothy in his absence, to strengthen him in the face of all this stuff that's going on in opposition and division, but most importantly, to remind Timothy about the faith that he once had and still does in a God who is much bigger than our apprehensions, a God who is much greater than our frustrations. A God whose voice ought to be far louder than the voices of our detractors. And most of all, a God whose love will always outshadow our fears. You know, I, I think there are times when we all need this kind of letter from a friend. A little note, maybe it's just written on the back of the bulletin, passed down the, the pew, not during the sermon. Maybe it's just something jotted down, sent in the mailbox, left, left under the windshield wiper of the car. 
Every so often, I think we need a little note from a friend, a few kind words to jar our memories, to remind us that the world isn't just some big dumpster fire we can't put out. And I love, I love that Paul begins this letter to Timothy by reminding him how much Timothy means to Paul. Because you know, it'd be easy for Paul to say, now remember how important I am. Remember, I've enclosed some outlines of sermons. I've enclosed some notes about some text I think you ought to share with the congregation. I've encl- No, no. Paul starts by saying, Timothy, you mean this much to me. I'm grateful to God, he says, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Isn't that something? Paul is just as anxious to see Timothy as you know Timothy is to see Paul. It's encouraging to know that there are folks all around you, to know that there are people in this world who love you. Do you know that? Stop and think about it sometimes. Think about it when the way seems dark, when you feel like, oh, I can't pay the bills, I can't do this, when life just seems insurmountable. Look down the pew on the pictures hanging on the living room wall. And be reminded that there's somebody, somebody somewhere who loves you and is praying for you. That makes a difference. And here Paul, Paul says it to Timothy. I pray for you, not just every once in a while, not just when I think about it, every night and day. It makes a difference. To know that there are people praying for you can make all the difference. Especially when the days are long and the way is uncertain. Have you ever been waiting in the doctor's office just sweating bullets? You know they've called you in. They tell you if the results were good over the phone, but they've called you in. Uh, We need you to come in. We got your tests back. We need to talk to you about a few things. Have you ever just been sitting there waiting, waiting for the woman to open the door and call your name to come back, just sweating? You know what's coming. And then all of a sudden, an odd sense of peace comes over you. As soon as you remember Oh, yeah, my Sunday school class said they'd be praying for me right now. Has that ever happened to you? Or have you ever been so anxious, so overcome by nerves and uncertainty, only to find yourself calm when the time came for you to give that presentation, to have that job interview, to take that test, because you remembered somebody, somebody said they'd pray for me. Has that ever happened to you? I tell you, there have been countless times in my life when I've been able to take a deep breath and plunge headlong into the tangled mess of life's uncertainty because I was confident somewhere, somewhere, there were some folks in this world praying for me. It's it's an encouraging thing. It comforts us. Of course, for some of us, no one can pray for us like Mama, and no one can pray for us even more than Grandmama. Can they? Maybe that's why Paul, Paul uh, speaks about the great faith of, of Lois and Eunice, of, of Timothy's mother and grandmother, a faith that Paul sees carrying on in the life of Timothy. Paul writes in the letter, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. Seems pretty obvious to me that this isn't the word, these aren't the words of some man just trying to sort of invoke grandma and mama to sort of get you to straighten up, right? I mean, Paul could have written, now remember your mama, remember your grandmama. I told them, I told them I was going to keep a check on you. I told them that I'd make sure you were straightened out. He doesn't say it that way. He says it is because it's obvious. These women meant something to Timothy. Timothy was not a a convert of Paul's, but most likely a convert of Lois and Eunice. Timothy came to the faith, was introduced to the way of Jesus by these women. They were the ones to first instill in Timothy the spirit of God and the desire to know God more fully through the reality of Jesus Christ. And perhaps it began when he was young. Even in a home, you know how it is. Mom and dad are both there. Sometimes, sometimes the kids get up and dad's already gone to work. And when the kids go, back and go to bed, dad isn't there yet. 
But there's mom. There's mom scrambling the eggs, packing the lunch. There's grandma picking them up at the bus stop. Mom, one of my, my maternal grandmother would always get off the bus stop at Ma's house. And she, this is probably one of the reasons I'm fat, and there's several. Um, <laughs> Somebody say amen. Was that you, Wanda? <laughs> All right. I, I remember that. I'd get off the bus, though, at Ma's house, and she'd have one of those, you know, those little cheap frozen pizzas sitting there on the stove, a deck of cards, probably some other things you can blame there, and, and a gallon sack of pennies, and we would play blackjack at the kitchen table and eat frozen pizza before we went to the nursing home to visit Merlene, my mother's, which is only a name from that generation. Merlene to visit my mother's, or my grandmother's sister. So you know how it is. Sometimes it's just mom, sometimes it's just grandma, instilling things into us. Of course, we could be here all day if I told you the things my grandma taught me, some things I can't tell you at church. But it's true, they instill them in us, just as they did to Timothy. They passed these gifts of faith down to him, a gift he would need not only to navigate the life of a follower of Jesus, but a gift of faith that would be eternally precious as he sought to live out his calling. Because so often, as anyone who stands in a place like this can tell you, so often it can become about the nickels and noses, it can become about the meetings and the committees, but if you lose sight, if you lose sight of the faith, the simple things that Christ has called you to, it's worthless. It doesn't mean anything. You need it. And it's precisely because of his mother and his grandmother's faith, because of their instilling this into Timothy, because of a faith in Christ that trusts him through whatever trials may come, that Paul then commends Timothy. He challenges him. Rekindle the gift of God that is within you. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Now, it would have been easy. It would have been easy for Timothy to simply give in to the pressures mounting all around him, to give in to the need to keep up with the Gnostics. I mean, he could have just run right along. Oh, I got some secret knowledge. I'll sell it to you, too. He could have gone right along with him. He could have trimmed down the gospel to simple Platonisms, sold bumper stickers in the church foyer. He could have done it. He could have boiled down the scriptures to just a few proof texts and shook that sugar stick every Sunday in the pulpit all the time. He could have done it. He could have, he could have given in and tried to mimic the pastors of Paul and John and all the others who had come through Ephesus, all the big names, all the big shots, everybody he remembered. He could have tried to give in and just sort of pander to those who longed for the good old days. It would have been easy. It would have been easy to allow the flame of faith that once burned so brightly, a flame sparked and brought to burn brilliantly by his mother and grandmother, to diminish to a flickering, apathetic ember amid so much division and retail religion. Because Lord knows so many succumb to that pressure. But the easy way in life, the easy way in faith is often, way too often, a way paved and worn by fear. Fear. Whether it's the fear of being different or the fear of those who are different. The fear of being left out for doing what's right. The fear of winding up broke or broken. Or the fear of just simply being told you're wrong. It's so incredibly easy to give in to fear, to what Paul calls a spirit of cowardice. And unless you think you don't do that, we all do. We all give in to that spirit every once in a while. May not be in big ways, may not be in ways that make the newspaper, may not be in ways that make us embarrassed to be seen with folks, but we do. We all give in to it. When someone's bullied, and we look the other way and go, well, at least it's not me. At least they're picking on someone else. When we roll up the windows and lock the doors, because there's just no way of knowing if that guy really needs a couple of dollars to get some food. There's just no way of knowing what he might do. So we roll up the windows and lock the door. When we don't say a word, when someone tells an ugly joke, 
uses a word, a, a name, or a label, we know not just to be uncomfortable, but wrong. And we don't say anything. When we simply let divisive, selfish, arrogant folks continue in their way, because it's a lot simpler, a lot easier to just say, well, they'll get over it. Well, they'll eventually just go away. It's a spirit of cowardice, a fear. However, God, Paul says, did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline, or to put it another way that I like a little bit better, the gift of the Spirit enables us to be strong, loving, and wise. And so Paul Paul goes on to exhort Timothy, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. In a culture where shame is not just embarrassment, but, but this idea of really being locked down, of, not, of being stupid. Don't be ashamed, he says. Rather, Paul encourages, encourages Timothy to press on, to join with Paul in the suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, the apostle writes, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. It's as if Paul is writing to Timothy to say, listen, is it going to be all all cake and ice cream on gold plates? No. Is it going to be sunshine and roses? No. Is it going to be dancing all the time? No. Is the road going to be rough? Yes. Is there a chance you might wind up in prison? Yes. Is there a chance you might wind up on a cross? Well, yeah. Will you have detractors? Doubters, critics, folks with an unnecessary sense of competition, inflated egos, and incessant desires to twist and distort the gospel message of Jesus. Yes, Paul says, you'll have all of those things and most of the time before breakfast. Paul implores Timothy to join him in that suffering. And not because, not because there's some great reward in self-deprecation. Somewhere, somehow we got that twisted up. Oh, if I suffer enough, I'll get something better on the other side. That's not not how it is. No. Because suffering is a part of this thing we call faith. And if you don't think suffering is a part of the Christian life, then you haven't seen that. Friends, you haven't looked at the cross. Too many folks today have been sold to Christianity that's light on suffering and heavy on success. There are too many folks who've been bought, who've bought into the notion that being a Christian means your worrying days are over. Just become a Christian and everything gets fixed. Everything's fine. Nothing can go wrong. Oh, yeah, Paul was in prison. Jesus wound up on a cross. But we didn't want to do that stuff. That's not for us. That's what they think. Or to paraphrase another preacher, there are some who are convinced that wherever Jesus is, there is no suffering. But friends, what we've forgotten is that wherever there is suffering, there Jesus is. So let us not be afraid. May we not be afraid to rekindle the fire of faith that burns so brightly, that longs to burn brightly within us. Whether it was handed to us from a mother, a grandmother, a father, a Sunday school teacher, a stranger on the street. Let us not be afraid to rekindle the fire of faith that longs to burn so brightly. May we not be afraid to shout the truth of Christ's love amid the cacophony of hatred, judgment, and self-serving religions that seek to drown it out. Because they are. And some of them come clothed with a gold cross around their neck. May we not be afraid to suffer, whether it is in the heartaches of life or the physical pains that rack our body as we face whatever this world may have to throw at us from all directions, may we take to heart Paul's words to his troubled friend and son in the faith. God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of strength and of love and of wisdom. May we feel that spirit move among us even now, as we pray together.
Gracious God, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, giver of the Holy Spirit, of strength, of love, and wisdom. Be with us now, we pray, O God, as we have heard your word. We pray it, we pray it is driven deep within our hearts we may be reminded that there are those who love us enough to pray for us every day. May we be reminded, Lord, of the great faith with which drew us to you in the first place. And Lord, may we rekindle that faith each day with a spirit of bravery grounded in your love and your grace when it would otherwise be so easy to forsake it. So Holy Spirit, move among us now. Speak to our hearts, God. Show us the way you would have us to go. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.